Bear in mind when we started the company, and even before that, when I started working open source in this stuff, we didn't talk about it as AI. It was a tiny niche and then nobody really cared. OpenAI sold vector embedding. So they had a certain API service where you could throw text at it and you got a vector embedding back. And they actually put on their website as like one of the solutions they had asked is like, hey, you can use WeVA to store these embeddings. And that was a very important moment in time for us. Database is a pretty classical piece of technology. So I start to notice that the way that we build the infrastructure technology and the way that developers interact with it is changing. That's very nuanced, but that is an interesting byproduct of the new database that is emerging. Hi everybody, welcome to the Devico Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Alex Sarikov and today I'm excited to have Bob Van Luy, CEO and co-founder at WaveWeat. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Bob and thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to talking. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. Entrepreneurship gave me... Freedom. Entrepreneurship deprived me... Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> My main superpower is... I'm just average. My main weakness is... That I'm just average. When I'm afraid, I... Meditate. Was there a specific moment when you realized you wanted to be an entrepreneur or did it evolve naturally over time? Supernatural. So I've never thought like, oh, now I'm going to be an entrepreneur. But I also never thought, oh, now I'm going to work in tech or I got to do this. I like to just wander around through life and then things emerge on my path. And I think entrepreneurship is a very logical thing that comes with that. But if my talent would not have been in technology, but in, I don't know, in cooking, I probably would have been running a restaurant. You know what I mean? It's like a natural kind of thing. What inspired the creation of VBA? Was there a problem you faced personally that led to this idea? No. So I would even go as far as that I say, like, it's facing a problem is a reason to start a company. But I think there's another reason to start a company, which is way more interesting. And that is being fascinated by something. And when I saw the early AI models and the early machine learning models, I was like, this is so cool. There must be a future with this stuff. Because bear in mind, when we started the company, and even before that, when I started working open source in this stuff, we didn't talk about it as AI. It was a tiny niche and nobody really cared. But I was so intrigued by it that I was like, if this must be something that other people are interested in. And that's how it got started. For listeners who are new to the concept, what exactly is a vector database and why is such a game changer in AI and machine learning? We work in the space of infrastructure, specifically database infrastructure. And every time when we store data can be around everything. Sometimes you have database for finance, so you have transactions, you might have text that you're looking through or images, all kinds of different data types, right, that we see in the world. Weaviate is the core database is called a vector database. And the vector embedding is a very old data type. It's a geographical representation of data. It's very old, but it came into prominence because of AI. So all the AI models that you use and that we use and love today, they use that stuff under the hood. We believe that you need to have a strong database that was specifically built for these kinds of AI applications to store and retrieve that information. And that's what it does. So it's very developer focused. It's tech that is used as pure infrastructure technology, but it's specifically made for these things that are coming out of AI models called vector embeddings. How has the demand of vector databases changed over the past two, three years? And what was driving that shift? What was the most important thing for a couple of things? So the first thing was that the models became more prominent and OpenAI sold vector embedding. So they had a certain API service where you could throw text at it and you got a vector embedding back. And they actually put on their website as like one of the solutions that they said they had like three solutions on there. And one of the solutions they had asked is like, hey, you can use WeVA to store these embeddings. And that was a very important moment in time for us. Very important also to bear, this was before ChatGPT and stuff. This is a couple of years back, but when we really started to integrate with these models, that was a very important moment in time because now the developers who found those models and wanted to use with them also found us. And that was when it really started to take off. How do you see the role of vector databases changing over the next three, five years, let's say? 
there's something interesting with vector databases besides everything with AI and the models that is very new. Database is a pretty classical piece of technology. So there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I'm using it all of my career, right? So I start to notice that the way that we build the infrastructure technology and the way that developers interact with it is changing. That's very nuanced. There are like a lot of nuances in there, but that is an interesting byproduct of the new database that is emerging. So that was not the initial reason to do it. It was a byproduct. Product, but it's a very interesting development. There is a lot of hype around AI right now. In your opinion, what's overhyped and what's not getting enough attention? I think if you look at it from an abstraction level, it's the same that for everything that it ever gets hyped. And that is that people present it as being a silver bullet. So the AI models themselves, or in our case, the factor embeddings, that people presented that as like saying like, this will solve all your search problems and your data storage problems. And that's, of course, not true. Is it a huge leap forward to that utopia of perfect data management? Yes, but it's, of course, not there yet. What was sometimes difficult in the hype was to make people aware of reality. If you are on the hype yourself, but that you have to tell the people who are hyping you, like, oh, oh wait, 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 it's an amazing piece of technology and it's amazing what it's doing, but we should not over over hype it because then people get confused so i'm actually pretty happy that the hype is still happening but it's not as crazy as it was one and a half years ago and i think that's a good thing as someone who built a company from ground up what's the best advice you have ever received oh that's a good question i got a lot of valuable advice from a lot of people Sometimes it's very concrete stuff that people showed me something that I was like, a, oh, can be sales related, product related, that I had like eye opening moments, but also support. That's not easy. So often the best advice came in the forms of support of the people that said eye opening things. I'm aware that this is not a really concrete example, but it's hard for me to give a concrete example because I'm thinking of so many things right now. I'm the type of founder that I use people's advice and recommendations a lot. As a tech founder, how do you balance visionary thinking with execution and team alignment? The risk of being the tech founder is that every week you see something new and you're like, oh, this is amazing. Oh, this is great. Oh, let's do that. But and, the, and the, and the most difficult thing is to say no. Yes, exactly. And keep focus. Right, so keep focus. But it's not saying no to your team, it's saying no to yourself. No to the new opportunities. <laughs> exactly. There are around hundreds of them over the Exactly, the exactly. Day. That's hard. At some point you've picked the path and then you just need to go. It's like, you know, if you're like in a rubber boat or when you go skiing, that's a better example, right? So you're skiing and then at some point I go this slope or that slope. And then at the moment you're off the slope, you can't ski back up, right? So now you must ride the slope down. And what I see some entrepreneurs do, they stop and they walk back up or they try to take a shortcut. I don't think that's a good idea. So the moment you've picked the slope, ski all the way down and then decide if you're going to take the elephant back up or keep going down. Very nice example. With AI infrastructure being such a hot space, how do you attract and retain top talent when there is so much competition? That is something that is relatively easy. So <laughs> if you're in a hype, so for some job openings, we get thousands of resumes. We're also a remote company, so that also makes it easier. There are certain roles we have where we expect people to be in certain areas, but we are a remote first company. So the attracting talent is easier. The retaining talent, I think there's a big cultural aspect to that as well. Do people feel valued? Do people feel that they're adding enough value? And those kind of things. That's a way to retain the talent. So I think retaining is harder in our space than finding. You mentioned VV8 has built everything in-house. Was that a conscious decision from day one? Or did it evolve over the time? Not everything, everything, but there's just a couple of things that are important to me. So obviously product, that's an obvious thing, but there can also be certain processes. I hired somebody to lead our people and culture team early on when we were still very small, because I knew if I'm going to grow this, I need people. And it's a culture, company culture is a thing. And I don't mean like, as you would say, like, yeah, duh, it's a thing, but I mean like, it's like a thing thing. It's like a challenge for the company culture is that if it's good, you don't really notice it. You go like, you know, uh -huh. just, you know, people go to work, they're happy, they work with customers, they do whatever. You notice it when it's bad, 
yeah. right? And oh boy, if it spirals out of control, it's that's a serious, serious problem. Also, those processes are something that we do in-house if we can. And if we work with companies to help us find talent, then that handover from them finding somebody to our internal process to align with how we're building the company is extremely important to me. What do you see are the biggest advantages of keeping development and infrastructure entirely internal? It's always a make or buy question, right? It's very difficult. The downside of doing something in-house is if there's just something available in the market that is just exactly what you need. Let me give you the example of the restaurant again, right? The metaphor of the restaurant. If you run a high-end restaurant, you want to be very specialized and you sometimes see chefs who grow their own vegetables and that kind of stuff. So they have like a lot of control over like the soil that they put it in and how much sunlight is getting. They might not go to the sea and get their own sea salt. Where they go, hey, you know, for the salt, we're okay, which is what we can buy in store. And that is very similar for the tech company as well. It's like, hey, you need to make smart trade-offs, but you get boxed out. But the problem with getting it boxed, so to stay with the restaurant metaphor, if you say, well, I'm not going to grow my own carrots, I'm going to buy them in bulk. Then if that does something to the taste of your dish that you don't like, you have a problem. That's always a trade-off and it's very hard to do. It's actually very difficult. There's a knee-jerk reaction to do as much as you can in-house for startups and there's sometimes a knee-jerk reaction to outsource as much as possible with enterprises and I think neither of those is good. It's like the balance is somewhere in the middle. Are there specific areas in your view where outsourcing makes more sense? Legal. Okay. So it's like a lawyer. There are certain startups who need lawyers on the team early because they add a specific value. But in our case, we don't need a lawyer on the team. As a remote company, when we go on a company trip, we have people help us prepare the trip because we're growing in size. So that there's quite some preparation. We outsource that, right? It can probably come up with a couple of other things. Sometimes certain research work that we have very, very specific, deep research work where we don't need somebody on the team full time to do that work for us, but that we're more than happy to pay somebody to help us with the research, those kind of things. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you have for CEOs or founders on how to build and retain a strong, innovative tech team? First, say the easy stuff, the low-hanging fruit stuff, right? There needs to be excitement in what people are building and you need to pay people well. And the reason I say the latter one, because in startups, this is different, but in certain enterprises, there's a whole hierarchy in how people are paid, yeah. right? So that a manager always makes more than an engineer. And I think that's wrong. You need to pay people based on what they're worth. So that's one thing. That's the easy answer. The more complex answer, I think, is in trust. So I trust that the people do the right thing. I'm not a micromanager, so I'm not looking at what everybody's doing doing all the time. I only do that when something goes wrong. So giving people that freedom, also intellectual freedom to add to the company where they think they can add value. I think that's important to retain a certain type of talent. Well, very interesting conversation. It was good analogies, examples that you provided. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for participating in the podcast. Thank you so much, Lek, and see you next time. Bye-bye. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Deveco Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.